Hello. In this cool grad video, we're going to talk about MS in Computer Science. We're going to talk about all the courses that are involved in this program and what career path you can pursue after that. And we're going to uh, review in some detail as to the structure of the program, what requirements you need to graduate, and give you an overview about an MS in Computer Science. So, the typical MS in Computer Science program structure. Typically, most universities would require you to get about 30 credits to graduate, at least like in the United States. So, assuming that each course gives you about three or four credits. So, assuming that most courses give you three credits, that's like about 10 courses. So, if you take 10 courses at a graduate level and get at least a B grade in each course, then you probably can graduate. And at the end, you have to do something called a like a presentation, you know, like a dissertation or something like that, and only when the committee approves it, you get your master's degree. So, so the program structure requirements and courses vary to some degree between universities. I don't think any two universities will have the same kind of requirements and program structure. So, most of the master's courses carry three or four credits. So, in any computer science master's or PhD program, I think almost anywhere in the world, there are two courses which are mandatory. That is computation theory and design and analysis of algorithms. So anywhere you go, if you become a professor of computer science, you would be expected to be ready to teach at any time these two courses, computation theory and design and analysis of algorithms. So even if you major in compiler design or you major in computer graphics or artificial intelligence and you become a professor of artificial intelligence, if you're in the computer science department, you would be expected to know computation theory and algorithms for any kind of course. These are like the foundational theory courses. So these two courses, either you have to take them at the graduate level or you can get a waiver if you've already done it at another graduate level. Like when I was doing my master's in computer science, I got a waiver for the, uh, I think, algorithms course because I already done it at a senior level in the undergraduate program. And if, you've, um, if you are from India and you've studied computer science, even at the senior level, it, it might be very different from what you study in Europe or in the United States at the senior level. So you have to talk to the concerned professor and if they give you a waiver, you're set. Otherwise, you have to take that particular course in computation theory and algorithms. And if you don't want to take the master's level courses, you can take the PhD qualifier exams. So if you do a PhD in computer science in any university, you have to take two qualifier exams and pass them. And uh, those are computation theory and algorithms. So as a master student, if you take the PhD qualifier exams in these two subjects and clear them, then you don't have to take the master courses. You get like a waiver and you can use that time to study something else. I'm just letting you know that's an option. So in any master's program, there are usually like three uh, ways to graduate. One is a thesis option, one is a project option, other is coursework option. So if you do a thesis, that is usually six credits. And a project, master's project is usually three credits. And if you do coursework, you just take like about 10 courses and graduate. You need, a, some universities insist that if you do a coursework option, you have to get 33 credits. Whereas if you do a thesis or a project option, you get you need only 30 credits. In some universities, they have this, you know, program structure. And in some other universities, regardless of which option you choose, you just have to get 30 credits and graduate. So it really depends. It varies between universities. So you can take seven or eight courses and six credits for a thesis. So that's usually considered one of the easiest options, meaning you do a thesis, you can do your research for one semester or a semester and a summer or maybe one year. You just keep working on it incrementally, little by little by little. And at the same time, you keep doing your courses every semester. That is three courses every semester. And in about one year or one and a half years, you might be set to graduate. It really depends on your advisor too. So a thesis option is usually considered one of the easiest because it means less coursework. And the other option is you can take eight or nine courses and then take three credits for a master's project. 
So that's uh, another option. And a master's project usually can be done in one semester or one summer or usually, you know, spread over a semester and a summer. Master's projects usually don't go more than eight months. I mean, usually it's done within a semester. Or you can just do coursework alone by taking 10 or 11 courses. So if you are planning to do your PhD later and go into research, then if you do a research option or a master's project option, it carries a lot of weightage. So you have an original thesis to your credit and it adds significant weightage to your application. But if you're planning to go to the industry, it doesn't really matter whether you do a thesis or a project or coursework. In fact, if you do more courses, you might be better equipped to deal with uh, situations in the IT industry. So if your goal is to just graduate and get a good job somewhere, it doesn't matter whether you do a thesis or a project or coursework. Some students I've seen, they think a thesis option is something really great and they think a coursework is somehow inferior. It's nothing like that. Like, for example, if you're applying for a job in Facebook or Google or Microsoft, unless you're going into the research department, they probably don't care much about whether you did a coursework option or a project option or a thesis option. But if you're applying for a PhD program, they may care a lot. If you do a thesis option, it adds significant weightage to your application. It shows an aptitude for research. So let's look at some of the typical courses in an MS in Computer Science program. Algorithm Design and Analysis. This is one of the courses. Computation Theory. That's about the fundamental theory of computation. Artificial Intelligence. Operating Systems. Computer Architecture. Computer Networks. Distributed Computing. Parallel Programming. Computer Security. Software Engineering. Software Testing and Quality Assurance. Natural Language Understanding, Computer Graphics, UI Design, Human Computer Interaction, Interactive Multimedia, Wireless and Mobile Security, Mobile Networks. These are some of the popular courses in MS and Computer Science program. They may also have courses related to programming on Android or about you know, mobile devices. There are new courses evolving all the time and some universities have some very interesting, uh, you know, courses in their departments but these are like generic courses that are offered in most of the departments algorithm design and analysis it involves designing algorithms and working out logic to solve problems it's about identifying the best way to solve a problem by working out the underlying logic study problems such as how to optimize code different sorting techniques for various data structure it's about the various ways in which you can store data in the database and how in different ways you can sort them. Time and space complexity. So in your undergrad, if you studied computer science, you might have studied all these notations, you know, big O of N and, you know, small O of N and, you know, sigma and this kind of stuff. It's about uh, the space and time complexity, meaning for a particular set of data, if we expand the problem by a factor of n. Is the time taken to solve the problem increasing as a function of n, as a polynomial function of n, or is it going to, uh, you know, occupy a polynomial function of the space? That's what we study in complexity theory. So, algorithms, it can be very interesting. It's like, you know, work out on a case-by-case -case basis. It was one of my favorite courses, and uh, it can be very interesting. And it's like a mandatory course, unless you get a waiver for it. Computation theory. Finite automata and uh, formal languages. So, um, in your undergrad, if you studied computer science, you would have already studied a little bit of Turing machines. And there's something called undecidability. And um, there are uh, concepts like P versus NP. That's polynomial versus non-deterministic polynomial time and space. So, for example, you might have heard of this uh, famous uh, paper, uh, uh, you know, this uh, accomplishment from one of the Indian professors. His name is Manindra Agarwal. He and his uh, team members, they uh, proved that primes is in P. So, if you haven't uh, read about that paper, I advise you to Google it and uh, 
look it up. Primes is the name of the problem. Primes is in P. They proved it. So for a long time, many decades, they thought primes is in NP. That is non-deterministic polynomial time. But then, through a lot of uh, you know sophisticated techniques, they proved that primes is in P. So what it means is, for example, let me just elaborate. Suppose you have a prime number. Suppose they give you a number that is about um, 20 digits long. That's a big number. And you have to determine whether it's a prime number or not. Assuming you take n amount of time. So n is a function of some polynomial function of 20. So suppose it's a 20 digit long number. You might take a 20 n cube amount of time to determine whether it's a prime number or not. Suppose they increase the number of digits and they give you a 21 digit number. How is the time taken to determine and solve this problem going to increase as a function of n? Is it going to be 20 times n plus 1 cubed or is it going to be some complex function of the previous number? Is it a polynomial function or a non-deterministic polynomial function? So that's basically the problem and then they proved that primes is in p. And it was a funny situation in um, there's something called NP completeness that is uh, once you take a particular problem you have to reduce it from an already NP complete problem and you know prove that this one's also NP complete there's something called reducibility and things like that you can study it in more detail and there was one guy at my university who had used uh, primes as an NP complete you know as a problem and derived everything else from primes and then next thing you know they prove that primes is in p it's actually polynomial it's not np complete and so he had to redo his entire research so i thought that was funny and um, computation theory like in india I, I, we had this course in my fourth semester of engineering in computer science and we studied fafl so find it on a matter of formal language but that wasn't enough for me to get a waiver in the computation theory and in my MS in computer science program, I took the advanced computation theory in my very first semester. I got an A grade and I did pretty well. Studied a lot about undecidability and uh, P and NP and NP completeness and all this stuff. But uh, the professor who was, one of the professors in the department who was in charge of this course, she would not give me a waiver for the introduction to uh, computation theory course even after I took the advanced computation theory course and got an A. And also in my undergraduate uh, engineering program, I had studied computation theory in fair detail. But she thought there were some key concepts that were not taught either in the undergrad, uh, and in, neither in the undergrad nor in the advanced course. So even though I took the advanced course, she would not give me a waiver for the introductory course. That was kind of crazy. She wouldn't give me a waiver and then I had to take the introductory course. So first of all, talk to the professors in your department and find out which courses are mandatory and take those courses early. Because if you don't clear them the first time, at least you'll have time to take it a second time. So um, computation theory can be actually very interesting. And uh, there were people, Europeans in my university, who had already studied a lot of very advanced computation theory and algorithms in their undergraduate, in the sophomore year and junior years. So there were a lot of like masters and PhD students in America who were studying all these concepts related to undecidability and P versus NP and NP completeness and stuff. But there were Germans in my university who had already done it in their undergrad sophomore year and for them it was all like a repetition at the master's level. So in some ways European standards of education might be much higher than the American standards. So that's something for you to think about. Artificial intelligence. So you study a lot of probability theory. It's actually very interesting from a simple problem like you cast a dice. You cast uh, two dice and you know what are all the possible outcomes you get. From a simple thing like that ranging to very complex operations. You know we study a lot of probability theory. And then there's machine learning. How to program a machine to think like a human mind. Neural networks. Neural networks is an interesting concept. So, you know, all the neurons in our brain are interconnected in a particular way. And sometimes it's like you train the neural network to perform a certain operation by adjusting the weights and stuff. And you, and then next time you test it by feeding 
another input it's supposed to use the trained uh, samples to work on the new input I had implemented a few projects in neural networks like um, for example uh, phase detection and recognition so from you give like if you feed the program a set of images it'll tell you which one has a human face in it or which one doesn't so wherever there's a human face it detects this and let you know so that's a example of training a neural network for face detection this Carnegie Mellon University has this on their website you can check out CMU website and uh, face recognition is another advanced concept so from a set of um, faces you train the neural network to say identify 20 images and then if you give any input from those 20 it will tell you which person it is that's face recognition and then uh, I also implemented another interesting project in neural networks that was about uh, biometric person identification so how to identify a person based on his uh, typing style so you know different people have different idiosyncrasies habits when it comes to typing some people use caps lock some people use shift some people use um, you know they make certain mistakes some people don't and you know some people they program in different ways you know people have um, some people type slow some people type fast some people make the same mistakes over and over again you know this time between using two keys all these um, parameters I capture all of them and from a set of 20 people you know if they had trained the neural network and then if one of them tested the neural network by giving their typing sample it would tell you who was typing I got about 80 percent accuracy and there are a lot of false positives of course because multiple people may have the same typing style but it was a very interesting project and um, I should have made it my master's project but I didn't and that was a mistake uh, Bayesian and other types of networks so we study uh, different types of you know neural networks and uh, all these interesting types of networks chaos theory so it's about how to find order in chaos using various complex variables robotics how to provide intelligence to a machine to think like a human operating systems how activities are scheduled queued and executed how processors memory ram and cache work so we talk about how various operations are queued and how they are executed and um, about pages and you know uh, how multiple processors work in coordination and how things go into the cache and into the ram and how you know things are picked up from the queue and executed how tasks are multiplexed and things like that multi-threading how a program can be forked into different ways different threads to different processors how to write your own operating systems like nachos you know you can create a simple operating system of your own if you understand the fundamentals so these are some of the things you study in operating systems so if you want to join a company like Microsoft or you know or Apple or you know like where you're working in the operating systems department and designing improvised operating systems then MS in computer science with an emphasis in operating systems is probably a good option so it's a mandatory course in an MS program I mean if you have done it at the undergraduate level you get a waiver but otherwise you'll have to you know uh, study operating systems computer architecture so you learn a lot about bus architecture and how uh, data is transmitted you know between different parts of the computer RAM random access memory and different types of RAM and how data is stored and logic design and stuff processors you learn about how you know to use multiple processors to execute your operations motherboard so how the architecture of the motherboard works and then how data passes across the components it's all at a fundamental system level specification and it can be interesting if that's your interest computer networks we talk about internet protocols seven layer OSI model so uh, we talk about uh, various protocols like HTTP that's hypertext transfer protocol and then there is uh, FTP file transfer protocol so there's all these protocols about how to transfer data there's a seven layer OSI model starts with um, 
application layer at the topmost and then physical layer. So there's a physical layer which talks about how the cables should be connected and crimped and all the stuff. And then there's the hubs and the modems and the switches which, you know, transfer data at the next level. Then there's the level of internet protocols and then there's like the security layer and then a couple of layers and then there's the application layer on top. So we study the seven layer OSI model for computer network design. We study how different networking devices work, modems and um, routers and all these devices. We study about web servers, secure data transmission, virtual private networks. These are like very important for an organization which is transferring encrypted data and data for whom data security is important. Distributed computing. How to use multiple distributed processors to execute a program. So if we, this is particularly important like in cloud computing. So where multiple people, are, clients are sharing processors, they are sharing uh, resources, they are sharing uh, databases, they are sharing you know, uh, space in the cloud, and not necessarily in the cloud, even if it's a program that is being executed using multiple processors. How do you, you know, suppose a hacker is attacking one particular system, how do you migrate the whole thing into another system and then um, lay a trap for the hacker so that he gets away, uh, he gets only crap and then you protect the actual data. You study a lot of interesting things in distributed computing. It's also about how to distribute the workload across processors and get the program done in a fraction of time. So identify what um, components of a program are parallelizable and then spread it across different processors and make sure the, you know, suppose the, by using one processor the program can be done in 100 seconds, using five processors can it be done in about 30 to 40 seconds. So we have to, you know, try and see how well we distributed the workload across different servers and while um, improvi improving the time to execute, making it faster, we should make sure there is no data corruption and there is no, you know, uh, error. Parallel programming. We talk about multi-threading using multiple processors, like for example, uh, George Washington University and Michigan Tech and a few other universities developed this language called UPC, Unified Parallel C. That's about, you know, C programming with, um, you know, multi-threading. So it's like using multiple processors to execute the same program and then passing data and inputs to various processors. So. We use multiple parallel processors to execute the same program and uh, show that it can be done in a faster way without corrupting the data. Computer security. So we talk about data security, viruses, worms, malicious software. So viruses are you know bad programs written by bad people which hack into your computer and um, corrupt your data and send you dirty emails and they can... Uh, uh, you know, steal your bank account password and, you know, misuse your credit card. They can do all kinds of bad things. And so we learn about honeypots. Honeypots are like traps laid for these malicious software. So they attack the honeypot thinking that it's really the data that they're trying to search. And then your actual data must be protected. So we learn about uh, ethical hacking when you do hacking for a good purpose. And the firewalls. So how to protect data in an organization secure data transmission. There's all these different protocols and how to do programming and encryption. We study all these techniques. Software engineering. So we learn about project management methodologies, agile versus waterfall versus hybrid, how to manage resources, systems and projects, how to manage, you know, the timeline, the budget, the scope of work, the risks, the contingencies and the entire project. So we learn that in software engineering. Software testing and QA. We learn about QA best practices, quality assurance, and uh, I have two, a few videos about QA best practices related to testing best practices, defect management, and also about um, agile best practices. I have entire videos about those which you can watch. How to author efficient test cases. I have a video about that in the QA testing best practices. Defect management. So in any project, whether it's in the university, a small project, or a large enterprise project, 
We have to know how to write test cases, how to execute them, how to log defects, etc. And quality assurance versus quality control for validation purposes. So we learn all this in the software quality assurance course. Computer graphics. How to create diagrams and data models to generate images and videos. So, uh, it's all about uh, like creating uh, pictures for you know animation and if your aspiration is for example to become a video game UI designer or an expert or join the film industry for you know animations then it's probably good for you to study computer graphics. We learn how to make animations, we learn how to make uh, animations, we learn how to make uh, you know the underlying that wireframe suppose you're trying to create a picture of Donald Duck you use it you create a whole series of dots and lines and a wireframe underneath which it represents Donald Duck and you know you can make it move in different ways and do different things by you know programming the underlying wireframe structure so we learn these things in computer graphics so UI design how to make software user-friendly so if you've designed a fantastic program but it's very difficult for people to use they're just not probably going to buy it so people spend a lot of time trying to understand what is easy for people to use and give them a good user experience there's web 2.0 3.0 guidelines for user interface design which teach you to design good web-based applications designing wireframes and comps so for any website so you should know what color combinations are good and how to use different UI elements like buttons, checklists, radio buttons you know what are all the ways in which you can make make it a good user experience while maintaining the aesthetic appeal user acceptance testing how to make it a uh, smooth end-to-end -end process flow for the user to execute so it's all about functionality appearance and also uh, usability so we learn this in UI design it's actually a very interesting program and in some software projects, we have designated people called UI experts. Their job is to design wireframes and comps and all these uh, artifacts which they provide to the team to implement. Wireless and mobile security. So there's something called Bluetooth, which is like wireless communication across a short range. So we design how to implement these technologies at a very basic underlying system level. And we talk about uh, firewalls, how to protect data in an enterprise by blocking attacks, various types of encryption and data privacy. So uh, with all these mobile devices, you want to make sure nobody can hack into them and you know steal your data and you know even if it's lost, you should be able to you know identify where it is. you know these are all these interesting things. Mobile networks. This was actually one of my favorite courses in my MS program, so. It's about how to create order in chaos. Now, suppose we have all these mobile devices like um, tablets, um, cell phones, and laptops, and all these things in a big conference room, and they have to communicate by sending signals to each other and forming routes. Suppose the person at this end wants to communicate with the person at the other end. You know, each device has a certain range, say two feet or three feet, by in which it can emit a signal. And the one that's nearby has to pick up a signal and transmit it. And then somehow the data packets have to find their way across to the other end. And somehow they have to be able to communicate with each other. It's about creating all these protocols in the chaos. And it was actually very interesting. And um, using simulation software to test and prove protocols. So there's like NS2 simulator. There's a lot of these uh, standard simulators which simulate mobile networks so these devices are all moving around and then um, we create these theoretical protocols which we then simulate and try and implement it was a very interesting course so human computer interaction the study of the relationship between humans and computers it's become one of the most dynamic and significant fields of the technical you know investigation so 3d visualization of scientific data Think about that it can be a complex thing to do but it's also very interesting developmental robotics you know robots are becoming more and more sophisticated so how to program them into higher and higher you know degrees of evolution of intelligence organizational applications of collaborative technologies and social media 
so how crowdsourcing works and how you can utilize all these um, you know data patterns that you gather across the social media for a particular cause things like that uh, optimization methods for complex designs game based learning game theory is also very interesting and then human factors computer graphics and geometric modeling cognitive psychology of human computer interaction it's about how humans perceive computers and how we can make it more friendly and useful for humans career options after hci so after human computer interaction masters program you can what are the career options you can choose you can become an interaction designer or user experience designer interactive systems designer engineer human factors expert usability engineer business developer product manager or consultant for example these are some of the things you can do thesis project or coursework so we already talked about that so if you do a thesis that's about 6 credits so you just probably have to take about 7 or 8 courses and you're good if you do a masters project that's usually 3 credits so you have to take 8 or 9 courses in addition to the project and if you do just a coursework option you might have to take 10 or 11 courses usually i'm just saying so if you find to do a phd or get into research later a thesis option is good for you and that's considered one of the easiest options what is a thesis a thesis or a dissertation is a document submitted in support of candidature for an academic degree or a professional qualification presenting the author's research and findings the term thesis is used part of a bachelor's or master's course dissertation is usually applied to a doctorate so in a phd problem a program you usually call it a dissertation and in some of the context it's vice versa so they call it a dissertation at the master's level and a thesis at the phd level so it really depends it doesn't matter so much i guess you must work on an original idea theoretical or experimental or on a hypothesis and present your research and findings to the world in a report the required complexity and or quality of a research of a thesis or dissertation can vary by country university or program so the uh sometimes you might get a phd without even you know doing without publishing a research paper but usually you have to have a dissertation at a masters level usually you have a presentation in front of the committee where you present some small research if you don't do a thesis or a project so a thesis is like an elaborate original finding that you work on a masters project usually involves designing a new protocol or an algorithm running a simulation to prove it implementing an existing solution or a protocol and optimizing it working on a hypothesis building a software tool package application or a game or a mobile app these can all constitute masters projects improvising operating systems compilers processors these are all examples of what you can do in a masters project core computer science courses so computer networking operating systems compiler design computer architecture database management systems these are usually like core computer science courses compiler design was actually one of the toughest courses in computer science at my university at least so at the undergraduate senior level most of the kids they spent like about 40 hours a week in the compiler design course alone and then advanced operating systems was one of the you know next most toughest courses so uh, some courses were easy like the quality assurance course was really easy and some of them were quite tough it also depend on, depends on which professor was teaching the course theory so design and analysis of algorithms and computation theory these are you know two mandatory theoretical courses so these are some of the core computer science courses either you have to take them at the masters level or you have to have a waiver if you probably took them at the senior level in undergrad you might get a waiver so i just picked a random university the university of arizona masters in computer science this program is kind of quite highly ranked it's usually around like the top 30 and most of the students in the university of arizona masters in computer science they go to internships in google or amazon or microsoft and most of them get converted into full time employment so so for example this is like the program structure which i took from their website as of the year 2016 principles of computer networking 
advanced operating systems, principles of compilation, computer architecture. These are some of the foundations of systems courses. Foundations of theory, so there's algorithms and theory of computation. And these are some of the electives. So there's one interesting course here called Green Computing. I think it's all about how to uh, program so that it's environment friendly or something like that. And there's algorithms in bioinformatics, so that's an interesting course. It's something to do with uh, something applied to genetics or something like that, or about people identification. And there's computational geometry, there's introduction to computer vision. So different universities offer some special courses or electives which some other university might not offer. So, so you have to do some of the core courses and a few electives. So you have to get uh, an A or a B grade in order to clear a course. And here it says sometimes if you get a C grade, you, it may be used towards major elective requirements. So in the core courses, they have to have at least a B grade. So this varies from university to university. Some university, every course you have to get at least a B grade. And if you get even a BC grade in one course, they can terminate your funding. And, you know, sometimes you have to retake the course. And if you get uh, less than B grade three times, you're out of the program. And if you get two F, F grades, you're expelled from the program. So that's usually, you're dismissed from the program. That's what it means. So George Washington University, for example, this is some stuff I found on their computer science department website. No area of concentration is necessary. Remember in the master's program, you don't have to really concentrate in anything. You, you can just have a generic master's degree and with you know a lot of breadth, requir breadth uh, requirements met, meaning your courses may span various disciplines. You don't have to specialize in anything. But you can't take a lot of, you know, sophomore and junior level undergraduate courses to count towards your master's degree. They have to be at the senior undergraduate level or mostly at the master's or PhD level. So even at the senior undergrad level, I think you can take only about two or three courses. They have to be at the master's or PhD level. So, algorithms and computation theory, they are core courses in almost any computer science program. Breadth requirements. I think you also have to meet breadth requirements, meaning you have to have some knowledge of database management systems, some knowledge of algorithms, computation theory, distributed systems, compiler design, operating systems. You have to meet the breadth requirements. So remember, in some PhD programs, they have something called an oral exam towards the end of the PhD, and they can ask you anything in computer science. Even if you're doing a PhD in compiler design, they can ask you a lot of questions about operating systems, artificial intelligence, or about uh, distributed programming, anything in computer science. And if you don't clear the orals the first time, maybe they give you a second chance, otherwise they can just kick you out. You don't get to get your PhD, because uh, they might just let you get graduate with a master's, because, well, that's the way it's set up. And so you have to have a general good knowledge about different areas of computer science to clear your oral exam. Some PhD programs have an oral exam, some don't, so it really depends, but I've heard of universities where this is true. Co taking courses from other departments. So sometimes uh, you can take related courses from the electrical department or mechanical department. Suppose there's a course in robotics in the mechatronics department. And if it's very close to computer science, you have to take prior approval from your computer science department to take that course. And then you can use those credits towards your master's in computer science program. Or if there's a course in sensor networks or something in the electrical department, if you get prior permission, you can apply those credits towards your MS in computer science program. But uh, without uh, prior permission, you probably can't use those credits for your course. So. Uh, you, I mean, your advisor and HOD must uh, review and approve which courses you can take from other departments. You probably can't take a course in music or economics or accounting or chemical engineering or physics unless they are somehow relevant to computer science. You have to take prior approval to take courses from other departments. So after an MS in computer science, what are the career options you can choose? Software engineer, you can be a developer solutions architect, web designer, operations research analyst, technical lead, 
database administrator, research engineer, or a field engineer. So later you can scale up to become a team lead and then you can split up into like management with few years experience or you can get more expertise and become a technical architect solutioning systems or you can become a database administrator or you can become a researcher or you can become a chief programming officer. So there are companies like Microsoft and other companies which realize that some people have a passion for programming, coding. They're just so happy to be programming. They don't want to become managers. They don't want to deal with people. They don't want to deal with databases. They don't want to deal with, you know, research. They're just so happy programming. So they created a special title called Chief Programming Officer. So they scale up the hierarchy and become Chief Programming Officer. So just to encourage their passion in programming. So I hope this gives you an insight into what a Master's in Computer Science program is all about. And I hope you make a better informed decision about whether you really want to do a Master's in Computer Science or would you rather do an MIS or MBA or a PhD. Think about it. Thank you.